region is very exposed, in theory at least, to various threats and to various vulnerabilities. The greatest one is the instability and terrorism in the Middle East, which could in affect the security of supplies and lead to their disruption. Um, but there are other dangers too. There is the risk that certain countries who export oil and gas will be subject to sanctions, which would interrupt supply. Uh, there's the danger of interference with the supply routes. Uh, there are many narrow points on the route from the Gulf to uh, Asia Pacific, um, uh, including the Straits of Malacca, of course, but also the Straits of Hormuz in the, in the, uh, in the Gulf. And we were reminded last night very forcibly by Prime Minister Lee of the importance of maintaining freedom of navigation. And then, of course, there's also the issue of cyclical trends in the energy market, the oil supply market, such as the price volatility, which we're seeing at the moment, such as the new energy which is coming on stream, particularly US, American shale, and, and natural gas. And that obviously will have its impact too. So I guess this session, as much as anything, is about how the risks can best be managed. How can the supply routes be best protected? Do we need more treaties, and agreements, security arrangements? Will the United States continue to be the prime agent for security from outside the region? And I think we had a very strong assurance this morning from Defense Secretary Carter that the United States remained wholly and strongly committed to the region. So those, that, I think, sets the framework for the discussion. We've got um, four members of the panel who will each speak briefly, and I've asked them to stick to five minutes. Uh, they'll have a chance for a second intervention later on after your questions. So I think we'll go straight into that. And I'm going to ask to speak first Peter Varghese, who is the Secretary for the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and, I think, Trade uh, in, in Australia. After that, I'll come to the Admiral, then to Pierre Noel, the energy expert from ISSS, and then to Melody Mayor for a view from the market. So with that, Peter, over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and can I also express my gratitude to um, the organisers for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, I want to make just two key points about uh, energy security. Uh, the first is that the best guarantor of energy security are open and transparent energy markets. Uh, and the second is that uh, without open sea lanes, there can be no uh, energy security for any of us. Um, so let me spend uh, my few minutes uh, discussing how these two preconditions are tracking in the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and I'll do so from the perspective of uh, Australia, which is one of the world's major energy suppliers uh, on track to be the world's largest uh, exporter of LNG within a decade and already uh, the second largest exporter of coal and the third of uranium. Uh, but also a country which uh, over the last several decades has uh, become a key provider of energy security to Japan, to China uh, and to the ROK and which hopes uh, over the next few decades to establish a very similar relationship with, uh, with India. Um, the, the broader story of the, of the Asia-Pacific is, uh, is one of growing trade uh, and economic integration and trade liberalisation. Uh, and by and large, I think uh, it's fair to say that the same trends apply to energy markets uh, in the region. Uh, of course, energy, uh, a bit like food, tends to be seen uh, as much more than uh, a simple traded uh, commodity. Uh, countries do worry about energy security from a geopolitical point of view. Uh, it is a lifeblood uh, commodity. Uh, there are many examples in history of countries being cut off from energy supplies for broader geopolitical reasons, just as there are examples of countries turning off the tap of energy to make uh, a point. So these psychological factors, if you like, uh, also need to be taken into account when we consider uh, energy security in the region. I think overall energy markets in terms of internationally traded goods uh, in Asia have worked reasonably well. 
Uh, domestic markets, I think, are uh, a different story. Uh, here, distorted price signals, uh, the lack of transparency, structural impediments behind the border barriers are all issues which uh, will need attention. And uh, well-functioning domestic energy markets are as important, arguably, as uh, well-functioning international markets for uh, energy security. And I think this element of structural reform for domestic energy markets is part of a broader story about the challenges facing most governments in the region uh, in dealing with uh, ec the economic reform agenda. Um, I think there are also some signs already that uh, state interventions in the energy market uh, in our region may be on the rise. Uh, for, the, for, for example, the expansion of uh, state-owned energy companies, domestic laws uh, which enable governments to take control of energy assets in a crisis, uh, new arrangements among ASEAN where states agree to supply each other first in a crisis. Now, these are all in their own terms understandable, uh, but they do move us in the direction of tending to constrain more open uh, energy markets. Um, for the Indo-Pacific, as for other regions, the biggest risk to energy security uh, is at the intersection of markets and geopolitics. Uh, and this is an important point to bear in mind, I think, particularly as we uh, discuss the South China Sea during uh, this Shangri-La dialogue, because the South China Sea is a crucial sea lane for energy security. Almost a third of global crude oil and over a half of global natural gas passes through the South China Sea, and China, for example, depends on sea lanes uh, in the South China Sea for 80% of its crude oil imports. So clearly anything which interrupts seaborne trade uh, through the South China Sea could have very large implications uh, for energy security. Now, uh, I'm not suggesting uh, that we are anywhere near that point now. Uh, no one currently has an interest in blocking sea, line, sea lanes uh, across the uh, South China Sea, and all of us, to varying degrees, but all to a high degree, are dependent uh, on open sea lanes. But it is precisely because the consequences are so large if sea lanes are blocked that we must ensure that we never get even close to the point where any country would consider uh, such a step. Uh, in short, if we want energy security in the Indo-Pacific, we must reduce geopolitical risk. Uh, and that is why it's important that we embed into the strategic culture of the region certain key principles. Obviously, the respect for international law, refraining from coercive behavior or unilateral steps, which could escalate tensions. Um, in short, the very principles that are set out in the Declaration on the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea. Um, I think it's also important to explore ways of addressing resource exploitation, even if sovereignty claims remain unresolved. Um, we live in a resource-hungry time, uh, and the South China Sea is potentially resource-rich. By some estimates, uh, 2.5 billion barrels of oil and 25 trillion cubic feet of gas. Now, the, the, the concept of exploiting resources in the absence of resolving sovereignty claims is not uncharted territory. Uh, there are precedents for joint development which is not contingent on resolving sovereignty claims. Um, Australia has done it with Indonesia and subsequently with East Timor. There are very many examples. Uh, and, of course, the Antarctic Treaty is another fine example of setting aside sovereignty claims to focus on cooperation, although obviously not in, in the case of the Antarctic mining, but, but rather scientific cooperation. Um, so let me just end with um, a couple of concluding observations. Uh, the, the Asian economic story has largely been built on two pillars. Uh, economic policies which look outward and value integration and take advantage of global trade flows, and st strategic stability which has given countries with the right policies the breathing space to grow. We are as dependent on these two pillars now as we have been 
in the last several decades. Uh, and because energy security sits at the intersection of the economic and the geopolitical, uh, the interests of energy security are best served by open energy markets and a stable strategic culture uh, and practices that are built around ensuring uh, continuing strategic stability at a time of great strategic and economic churn in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for that, and thank you for keeping to the time. That was a very, very good example. Um, and I think you very skillfully brought together both the domestic aspects and the international security aspects, and we should discuss both in the course of this session. I'm now going to turn to Admiral Kawano, who is the Chief of Staff of the Japanese Self-Defense Forces. I think you're going to speak, sir, in Japanese, so if everyone wants to tune in, they should put their headphones on now, and that includes me. Uh, I speak English. You're going to speak English? Yeah, All yes, right, yeah, okay, yes. you're going to listen in Japanese. <laughs> way, right? Okay. Speak yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Powell. It's a pleasure for me to stand, be here as a chief of staff, general staff of Japan, to address the Shangri-La Dialogue. Last year, Mr. Prime Minister Abe delivered a keynote speech here and mentioned the importance of the rule of law to promote peace and prosperity in Asia. The speech was welcomed by many participate, participating countries. In order to maintain energy resources and national security in the Indo-Pacific region, open and stable seas upheld by maritime order governed by law and rules, not by force, continue constitute global commons for peace and prosperity of the international community. One year has passed since Prime Minister Abe's keynote speech, while maritime order is underpinned by the international law of the sea, primarily based on the anchors. There are still interesting number of unilateral attempts to change the status quo by cohesion. In addition to policies, the region has seen some cases where a coastal state has restored to unilateral actions and assertion of her own rights. Therefore, each country should make effort to deal with the challenges, while international society need to establish and follow proper international rules. I would like to introduce one example of Japan's efforts. When I participated in the WPNS, Western Pacific Naval Symposium, last April at my previous position, CUTS was unanimously approved. Appreciating the approval as the chief of staff of joint staff, I have instructed all ships to implement the cues in a firm manner. Speaking of relationship between Japan and China, both countries share great responsibilities in maintaining peace and prosperity of the region. In the Japan-China summit meeting held last year, both leaders reaffirmed the principles of mutually beneficial relationships based on common strategic interest and took the important first step to improve the relationship. As a result, joint working group consultation concerning communication mechanisms was held between the defense authorities of the two countries for the first time in two and a half years. Both authorities are continuing positive consultation in order to begin the implementation of the communication mechanism as early as possible. To avoid miscalculation in the Indo-Pacific region, I hope each country will observe and implement law and rules instead of exercising force. I am determined the JSDF will contribute even more to maintaining stability of the Indo-Pacific region by enhancing cooperation with other countries 
in the region in order to enjoy benefits of stable energy resources as well as to maintain and foster open and stable seas. As coordination and cooperation with countries in the Indo-Pacific region regarding energy security, 24 years ago, Japan, participating in mine sweeping operations in the Persian Gulf, as first JSDF activities abroad. abroad. Currently, we have sent two, sent two destroyers and two PCCs for anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden, which is the main maritime transportation artery. In addition, we dispatched the JSDF Admiral as the commander of CTF-151 from this month as the first Japanese commander of multinational forces. Through these efforts, Japan will continue to conduct anti-piracy operations in cooperation with countries concerned and promote their efforts. As a peacetime effort, Japan will continue to take various opportunities such as multinational minesweeping exercise in Persian Gulf, distant shores, in Australia, Cobb North, Guam, and Limpac. Through participation in this training and exercise, Japan will establish and foster relationship with armed forces of each country. As you know, Japan and the United States released the new guidelines for the Japan-U.S. defense cooperation last month. JSDF will cooperate more closely with not only the U.S. forces, but also other countries which share strategic interests, such as Australia, LOC, ASEAN countries, and India. Japan will contribute to realize open and stable seats for security and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region and promote anti-piracy mission and various joint exercises. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Admiral, thank you very much. You naturally and rightly focused on the security aspects, the naval and military security aspects, and I'm sure you will get some questions about Japan how Japan sees its future role in that regard. Thank you very much for that and for keeping to the time. We now move on to Pierre Noel, who most of you will have read if you haven't actually met him. He is the IISS's energy guru, I think I can safely say. And uh, he's promised not to be too guru-ish, but, uh, but to talk in language that we can all understand. So Pierre, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, no, no worship, please, um, <clears throat> of the guru. Um, no, I'm, I'm hopefully not going to behave as a guru today, and I, I tend to uh, not do that. I just want to start by reminding uh, what an incredible journey, what an incredible journey Asia has been through over the past 10 years. And when I say Asia, it's really a lot uh, to do with China. China went from uh, a self-sufficient energy country to the largest oil importer in the world in just 10 years. China became a net oil importer in 2003, and uh, very recently they, um, they became officially, so to speak, the largest oil importer in the world. If you move yourself um, uh, <clears throat> in your mind uh, ba uh, back 10 years, and you remember what dominated the strategic literature about uh, the, the link between Chinese energy demand and Chinese foreign policy, it was a really bleak and worrying picture. People were mentioning the, uh, you know, that China would bypass the oil market, uh, uh, create bilateral links with producers. Some people went as far as suggesting that the entire Chinese foreign policy would be uh, organized around the procurement of, uh, of energy. Some people mentioned resource wars, China uh, um, trying to control uh, producing regions, etc. Well, it didn't turn out to work like that. The uh, global oil market actually uh, absorbed, I would say, and, and met Chinese demand very effectively, of course, at a price, and I really do believe, and I'm nothing original here, that the, 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 
the appetite for energy and especially for, for oil in China is a key explanation of you know, well, the, the, the equilibrium price of oil going from $25 to $110 in, uh, in, in, during the same, the same decade, of course, but that's exactly how a market works. Uh, the, 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 the market meets uh, demand at a price that makes it compatible with, with supply, but that's, that's, we should be grateful for that. I mean, this is a key institution that allows to uh, combine global peace, uh, international peace, with, uh, with um, economic interdependence. And those market mechanisms have served Asia and China very well. Uh, now, of course, that's not to say that there are no, no issues, no questions, and uh, the, the, the energy security issue energy supply security issue in Asia has transitioned, migrated to issues of trade security. The real problem is the security of those sea lanes that bring uh, imported energy to uh, Japan, uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, of course, and, and further, further west, uh, India as well. Um, the US, in its, I would say, public diplomacy and including defense diplomacy here at the Shangri-La Dialogue and in the meetings around the Shangri-La Dialogue has become very keen to present uh, this issue in terms of a public good. Uh, and, and there's good reason for that. I mean, tr trade security, seaborne trade security has many elements of a public good. And so that's a nice way to frame the uh, rise of uh, the maritime rise of China and India and other Asian powers as a, a changing context for the provision of those public goods. And I've heard a US, uh, senior US military officer mention in an IISS meeting, uh, China and the US one day will, pat will patrol the commons together. So you know, this, this very nice way of framing the new geostrategic situation whereby we used to provide the public good on our own and now we're going to cooperate more with uh, rising powers to do the same thing. Uh, well, when you, look, when you think about it in more detail, it's not quite obvious what public good the US actually provides. Um, what type of security does the oil market or the, or the seaborne energy markets really need? So if you take the three points, I mean the, the, the three um, um, sensitive and important naval uh, areas for Asian energy supply. You've got the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of, of, uh, Malacca, of uh, yeah, or Malacca and Singapore, and the South China Sea. So you take them in reverse. The South China Sea really does not present any threat to shipping. Uh, most of the threats to shipping, or to shipping security are close to the shore. Uh, so you look at the, the Straits of Hormuz and the Straits of uh, Malacca and Singapore. The Strait of Malacca and Singapore, the US has actually played a minimal role in ensuring security and safety uh, over the years. Actually, the, the, the security of the Strait of Malacca is uh, ensured by littoral states, I mean co coastal states, with some technical and financial help from a number of user states. Um, Japan has been extremely involved on the technical and financial side of that. Uh, Korea to some extent, and increasingly the oil exporters of the Middle East, so the people who really have a, a direct uh, commercial interest in uh, shipping being secure here have helped the coastal states ensure this security and safety. Those states have actually always resisted uh, more involvement by the US into, uh, into the security of the strait. Ormuz is very different, of course. Uh, Ormuz, I mean, the U.S. plays a, a very active and key role uh, in the security of the Strait of Ormuz and even further into, into the Gulf, but certainly for the Strait of, of Ormuz. That uh, is, uh, uh, is interesting because the Strait of Ormuz is increasingly important for Asian economies, but the U.S. reliance on internationally traded oil is, uh, is declining fast now. So we could perhaps imagine a transition into the regime, the security regime of the Strait of Hormuz, whereby both Asian powers 
and uh, and local uh, local states, li literal states in the in the in the Middle East would uh, take uh, on a more on a more important role in the the security provision. The real public good, and it, this has been said very eloquently by um, our uh, Australian uh, panelists, sorry, um, before me, the real public good has been peace itself. So the challenge that we face in Asia in terms of, of energy supply security is, I would say, much simpler, and, but also much more intractable than uh, you know, bringing China into the provision of a public good. It's really about managing the changing balance of power, the, the balance of power transition, which was the key theme of uh, the Singaporean Prime Minister's speech yesterday. You know, we all know what's going on, and we have um, the end of the U.S. military primacy in Asia, which doesn't mean the U.S. is going to leave uh, to leave Asia, but its military primacy is coming to an end, and you've got the rise of a new regional military superpower. Uh, will this transition happen peacefully? I don't know. Uh, we can all hope for it, but that's really the key determinant of all of Asia's energy supply security in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. That was another very valuable contribution. Again, I'm sure we'll give rise to some questions. And then lastly, Melody Mayer, you're going to give us a view from, from the market. Melody is in charge of Chevron in the Asia Pacific and its production and marketing. And she can tell us what it looks like from the business point of view, Melody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the group today. So as one of the largest producers in the Asia-Pacific region and for many, many decades, we are very well aware of how important it is to provide safe, reliable, and affordable energy, which underpins the economic growth of this region. Uh, Asia's economic growth is definitely underpinned by energy supply and energy security. So I want to talk about three major um, points uh, in my remarks. First, the scale of demand growth in this region. Secondly, the need to develop supply. And thirdly, and very importantly, is the role of energy partnerships in being able to provide the supplies needed to meet the growing demand. So first, the scale of the demand in the region. Uh, it's very, very well known that the center of gravity for the global energy system is shifting towards Asia. Growing economies and rising standards of, of living in the region have made this an area of focus for new energy markets. Demand for affordable energy here will only continue to grow. By 2030, the region is expected to be the world's largest consumer of crude oil and natural gas. Most analysts forecast that by 2025, Asian demand for liquefied natural gas will double. And what's not fully appreciated is just how much catching up we have to do in, pro in energy. Take Thailand, for example. It has a growing and successful economy, yet its per capita energy consumption is about one quarter of that in the United States. In India, the average citizen consumes less than 10% of the average American. The scale of the challenge is also reinforced by the anticipated global decline rates and the massive investment required just to be able to stand still to, in supplies. In the next five to 10 years, around 300 billion barrels of oil will need to be developed and brought to market. And that's an energy of an investment on the scale of $550 billion to support this um, growth. So while we don't know what the world's going to look like in five to 10 years, we really shouldn't lose focus on the fundamentals. Long-term demand is supported by a rising global population and economic growth, with more than 2 billion people expected to enter the middle class over the next 20 years. So that brings me to the next point, which is the need to develop supply and the long cycle time of developing supply. Asia stands today as a net energy importer. That's good. There's good news, though. The region also holds great promise as an energy supplier. It has abundant energy resources in geothermal and fossil fuels, including its most abundant resource, which is natural gas that can be converted to LNG and, and moved around the region. Domestic natural gas should always be the first resource developed. It provides jobs, taxes, royalty, enables local industries and economies to grow through reliable and affordable energy. Chevron has experienced this firsthand as the largest domestic producer of natural gas in both Thailand and Bangladesh. 
But not all gas consumers in Asia have, sophistic, uh, have sufficient domestic resources to draw from, and that leaves the balance of Asian natural gas over 40 percent to be met by imports uh, by pipeline and LNG. In the Indo-Pacific region are um, two projects that we have uh, under development, Gorgon and Wheatstone LNG projects are underway in Australia, will make a major contribution to regional energy security for many decades to come. However, as the EIA has pointed out in their 2014 World Energy Outlook, the reordering of energy trade flows towards Asian markets increases Asia's vulnerability to the implications of a possible shortfall in investment or a disruption in oil supply. So in this regard, this region has a great deal at stake in ensuring that world's energy markets get the balance right. So my last point is around energy partnerships. Growing energy supplies is never easy. And today we're challenged by more costly and complex projects with constantly changing geopolitical issues and rising expectations for environmental protection and community engagement. Gas, oil, and LNG projects can be decades and billions of dollars in the making. In fact, the EIA estimates that projects supporting oil and gas imports to China and India alone through 2035 will take $2 trillion in investment. As partners, companies, and, gun and governments and countries need to take the long-term view. In doing so, we can maximize the benefits of resource development for the producing countries of Asia and um, achieve energy security for tomorrow. For the countries involved, a key component of this long-term strategy will be creating the stable, competitive business environment, um, investment certainty that's needed, which, which, which underpins um, the development of energy and energy security. On, on the, everyone, uh, international oil companies, large caps, need to bring exceptional value to these, to these partnerships, capital, technology, and excellence in execution. So the last partnership I also want to mention is just the partnership with communities and in which we operate. We also need to develop and support the communities we work with. A supportive and engaged community is also critical for energy security over the long term. Thank you. Melody, thank you very much for that as well. Now, I think we, we can say really we've got most of the cards on the table. Uh, we've talked about the functioning of energy markets in this part of the world, and on the whole, they're thought, it's thought that market mechanisms have functioned pretty well, but there have been distortions, distortions through subsidies, distortions through uh, government intervention. We've talked about the security of supply in terms of possible interference with supply routes. We've talked a bit less about the security of production in the main area of interest to uh, the Asia Pacific, which is the Gulf, and we all know what the threats to production there are from ISIS and other, other, um, other sorts of turbulence. And then Melody has reminded us of the importance of supply, energy supply in this region, uh, of measures to encourage it, and the need for stability. Uh, in order to get the investment which you need to get a secure supply here. So at least three broad areas. Now I'm going to open the floor for questions or points. Um, I'll take about three or four and then ask the panel to respond. Uh, if you could ask for the floor in the traditional ISS way, which I assume works this year, is to stand your card on its side. It's not impossible to do with one hand, I discover already. But uh, anyone who wants to speak, uh, just please do that with their card, and we'll take you. So who would like to go first? Yes. It just occurred to me that none of the four panelists uh, mentioned the word climate change. Um, do they not see this as a key element um, in understanding the nature of energy security challenge. I mean, there are different aspects to energy security, uh, and I appreciate all the presentations made. But um, for countries that are dependent on coal and will continue to be dependent on coal, um, climate change poses an important energy security challenge. Thank you. Yes, Michael. Mm -hmm. Chairman, very much a question rather than a point. We've had four very fine uh, introductory statements, but we haven't 
heard a Chinese perspective on these things, and I just wonder if there is some uh, member of this group or someone from the platform who can say something about the new maritime silk route idea and to what extent where the rhetoric is very much about a sort of public good that China is seeking uh, to provide in its win-win um, approach to these reviving these old chains of supply across the world. I wonder how far a Chinese perspective uh, sits well with the four presentations we heard at the beginning. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. I'm honestly not sure whether there's somebody who would regard himself as speaking for China in this room or not. If there is one you wish to volunteer, your comments will be very gratefully accepted. Um, if there's not, we are, we'll come up with something for the panel, no doubt. Uh, right. First of all, Mr. Neil, and then Mr. Maeda. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, a question to Admiral Kawano. Um, with the horrific earthquake disaster, uh, the Tohoku earthquake disaster, um, and the tsunami, uh, Japan essentially abandoned its uh, nuclear uh, power generation and switched overwhelmingly to uh, fossil fuels, uh, particularly LNG, for its, uh, for its energy security. Um, could, Admiral, could you explain or shed some light onto how this perhaps changed the strategic outlook for the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force in uh, securing energy resources along the sea lanes of, of communication? Um, if I could abuse my opportunity as well, I do have a question for Ms. Mayer, which is, um, can she give an assessment of what energy resources exist in the South China Sea, particularly around the Spratly Islands? Apologies for those two questions. Thank you very much. No, they were very legitimate questions. I'll take one more, and then we'll go to the panel, and then we'll come back, and Scott Whiteman, you'll be the first at the second round. Right, Mr. Maid. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Chairman. My question is going to uh, Ms. Meyer, because uh, we joined the same conference in Beijing before coming here and went to uh, Singapore. My question is that uh, uh, on the uh, logistics of the uh, natural gas, uh, obviously that is uh, some security concern on the Strait of Malacca, and so uh, very uh, legitimate uh, logistics come directly from the U.S. West Coast or West Coast from Canada. Uh, because uh, if it goes through the, the from Mexican Gulf to uh, Panama's Canal, it takes uh, 20 days to uh, Japan to or China, but it's it, it would be very easy to uh, easily undercut to, if uh, to up to eight days or nine days from West Coast of, U, of U.S. and Canada. How uh, you, is your views of the uh, likely food? Of that, the U.S. West Coast uh, will uh, it, be a create some export terminal uh, or some strategic kind of uh, assessment of uh, the government, for example, of uh, the U.S. government and Canadian government uh, to promote this idea. Right. Well, we come back to the panel. What I'm going to do, without warning, is ask, ask first of all Pierre Noel and perhaps Peter Varghais if they have any comments on the climate change point. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, the people who should really worry uh, are not the people who consume coal, they're the people who are selling coal. Uh, th these are the people who will actually see their business disappear because of the, uh, of, of the move away from fossil fuels. From the conception perspective, the demand perspective, the research I've done in, in, in Asia uh, brought home very clearly the point that the, the you know, governments in this region, especially Southeast Asia and China, they really worry primarily about quantitative problems. You know, they have to fuel economic growth. Uh, in a country like Vietnam, electricity consumption is rising 12, 13% a year. Uh, you know, in Europe, it's declining 1.5% a year. In the US, it's flat. I mean, these are countries with extremely rapidly growing needs for energy, 
both primary energy and, and electricity. So that's the key, you know, the qualitative problems, including envi the environment, which is not the only qualitative problem, but it's the main one, the qualitative problems come second, um, or even third, because uh, just after the quantitative challenge comes the, the cost issue. So really the climate change the climate change problem in uh, Asian developing countries is really all about the cost difference between carbon-free energy, or let's say clean energy, more generally speaking, and carbon-intensive energy. Um, for a number of years, until fairly recently, this cost difference was actually increasing, and increasing fairly fast. So, personally, I've was pretty pessimistic. Uh, now, clearly the trend has uh, bended and the cost of renewable energy sources has been falling off much more quickly than anybody anticipated. In some countries where the conditions are right, um, photovoltaic solar is actually cost competitive against, um, against gas-fired generation or even sometimes coal-fired generation. So the, this is changing. On the other hand, within fossil, fuel, fossil fuels, the cost difference between gas and coal, uh, and gas is, you know, coal is twice as, twice as much polluting as gas per unit of electricity generated. Uh, the, the cost difference has narrowed, right? So this all goes in the right direction, if you want. And, and countries who primarily care about the cost of their energy procurement will find it less difficult to uh, green their energy systems than, than was the case, uh, the case recently. Uh, but in the long term, it's really the people who are selling coal who should worry, not the people who are reliant on coal. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, Peter, would you like to add something on the climate change aspects? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, look, I, I think the connecting thread between mm -hmm. energy security and climate change really uh, goes through um, energy efficiency and, um, uh, and also technology. And let me just build on that. Um, th there is enormous scope for improving energy efficiency in all of our economies. Uh, and the better we do with energy efficiency, the better the outcome will be in terms of climate change objectives. Uh, and I think it's important that uh, all of us uh, essentially pursue uh, an energy efficiency agenda. Uh, I think it's also the case that ultimately uh, technology will be the determinant uh, in terms of the sort of cost variables that, uh, that Pierre was speaking about. Um, now, there may, it may well be that uh, there will become a time when uh, coal uh, is not required, and so um, the demand side may fall off, but I suspect uh, that's going to be some quite considerable way uh, into the future, uh, and in the meantime, for a number of countries, uh, the uh, affordable option that's most readily available to them uh, will be coal. And again, here, here, here there's an opportunity for technology to play a role uh, in terms of whether uh, they are ways through clean coal technology or carbon capture and storage, uh, where the use of coal and the impact on climate uh, uh, can be uh, can, can, can be minimised. So. Um, I think in, in a longer period of time, both energy efficiency and technology will shift some of the cost curves that Pierre was speaking about. Thank you. Um, Admiral, I'll come to you yes. next with a specific question to you. Uh, I, it's, it's, I, I'm sorry, I'm speaking Japanese. Right, it turns on. え、まずあの、え、東日本大震災によってま、あの、福島の原子力発電所の第一号があったのは事実であります。で、これによって原子力発電について全廃すべきだという国民の世論が盛り上がったのも事実であります。ただ、今の政府の方針は、え、安全基
原子力発電所は再稼働させるというのが今の日本の基本的なポリシーです。したがって、えー、大東日本大震災の後においても、日本のエネルギーの構造が基本的に変わるということがはありません。したがって、えー海,あのまあ、海上自衛隊のメインミッションであるシーレーン防衛ということについては、この基本戦略は、基本的には東日本大震災を受けた後も変わりはないということです。はい、Thank you, Admiral. Now, Melody, there were at least a couple of questions addressed to you about the actual resources which there are in this part of the world, and a question about developing gas terminals on the US West Coast. Yeah, on the question of、um, prospectivity of oil and gas in the South China Sea, there, there is、um, It's unknown. There is very little data or information、um, across the South China Sea. It's an unexplored area, so there's very little、um, seismic or drilling that has occurred. And so the industry, you know, to really understand prospectivity in an area, you have to conduct seismic surveys and、uh, exploration to really understand the potential for the region. So it's, it's relatively unknown. Um, with respect to logistics and transportation,、um, certainly for LNG, there, there are、um, different cost b a s i s for transportation、um, depending on the routes. And、um, certainly, the, the、uh, west coast of Canada, Alaska, that region of the world、uh, would have much cheaper, less costly shipping to the Asia Pacific region. And there's quite a few projects that are under consideration in that region of the world.、Um, our company has、uh, Interest in the Kitimat LNG and Pacific Trails Pipeline project that's under consideration for LNG. What, what I also might mention around the overall global logistics is the energy industry is very dependent on the, a global supply chain. So we fabricate material and goods and equipment all over the world and very heavily here in the Asia Pacific region. So it's not just、uh, only the, the transportation of oil. And LNG and products around the globe, it's also the、um, movement of this global supply chain, fabrication, and equipment around the world that is very essential for energy development. Well, thank you for that. Now, I haven't seen a volunteer to speak for China. We don't have subpoena powers here, unfortunately. Um, what I'm going to do is proceed, first of all, to take the second round of questions, starting with Scott Whiteman, the new British High Commissioner to Singapore. And then,、um, Mr. Sorry, the trouble is, when you put your things this way up, I have to stand on my head to read them. Anyway, Mr. Chung, you'll be second. And then, it's no good, I can't read it at that distance, but you're third. So we'll start with Scott Whiteman.、Uh, thanks very much, Charles. I was actually going to make the two points that、uh, Peter Vargas made about the importance of reducing demand and diversifying su-、uh, sources of supply, particularly through the development of、uh, low carbon energy sources as key、uh, means of delivering or enhancing、uh, energy security.、Um, but I- I'd simply then amplify the, 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 the important point that、um, uh, Mr. Baru made about.、Uh, Climate change. And there's a collective responsibility. It's not an Asia Pacific responsibility, but there's a collective responsibility、um, on all of our governments to make sure that at the negotiations in Paris at the end of this year,、um, each individual country's、um, nationally determined contribution to reducing global emissions adds up to a comprehensive and ambitious、uh, package that can control uh, emissions. Uh, that will Uh, provide security benefits not just to energy security but food security、uh, and other、uh, resource security and human security、uh, in the decades、uh, to come. Those contributions obviously have to reflect、uh, historic responsibilities and capabilities,、uh, but it's an absolutely key challenge for the global community this year. I'm sure you're right, it'll dominate the international agenda for much of the year. Right, Mr. Chung.、Mm. And thank you, Chair.、Um, I want to pick up、uh, Pierre's point and Admiral Kawano's point about、um, energy security as it pertains to the South China Sea because I think we have to go back to first premises when we talk about energy security in the Asia Pacific region. Whose security is being threatened and who is threatening such security? Because if you, if you study、uh, what China has been saying, and again, I, I do not speak for China, I'm merely quoting what China has been saying, is that they do not threaten. Freedom of navigation, they do not threaten commercial shipping、uh, in, in the South China Sea. And I think to a large extent that is true. 
So when you hear the Americans or Westerners talk about, you know, or even the Japanese talk about, there's, there's a threat to commercial shipping in the South China Sea, I think that is over extrapolated, that's exaggerated. Let, let me put forward two points. Um, there's an assumption that with the, the reclamation that China is doing in the spread lease, that China is, is introducing a, a new threat dimension to commercial shipping, seaborne energy. It's not true because China already can do it. China has a southern fleet located in Hainan Island, which is about 800 kilometers away from the spread lease. So easily, um, China has the capability to threaten you know, the entire stretch of sea, the South China Sea from Hainan all the way down to the Philippines. Second point being, um, history has shown that it's easier to block off a narrow strait, say the Straits of Hormuz, which we've seen in the 80s, than to block off a an, an relatively open sea, which is, the, which is the, you know, the South China Sea, very open, very hard for you to defend. And in fact, I will, order, I will offer the proposition that it was the, the so-called slot thesis, slot track thesis um, that, that has come up is, as a, is, is not due to Western countries or European countries threatening about energy security, but it came from the PLA itself. Because the PLA, they, they, they studied this, this thesis that Chinese oil supplies could be threatened if there's a closure in the Malacca Straits thesis. And I'm quoting uh, Greg Austin, I do not know if he's here, but he's a fellow at the East-West Institute in New York. He's saying that Chinese strategists hyped up the idea of a Malacca threat closure uh, uh, or thesis basically to, to get a, a pretext to hype up the, the PLA defense budget. So I'll, I welcome your comments. Thank you. Well, and that will be a challenging question when it comes to the panel. Is the threat to security of supplies in the South China Sea actually exaggerated? But secondly, were the Chinese themselves responsible for exaggerating it? So we'll come to that. Uh, now, yes, Mr. Karikama. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I would like to focus on this uh, demand and the supply side uh, that was emphasized uh, by the speakers. Uh, uh, we uh, see that the, in the Asia-Pacific uh, region with the growth, increase in population, increase in middle class, the demand is, uh, for energy is uh, increasing in a rapid space. And uh, as was mentioned, uh, on the supply side, U.S. has uh, become an uh, energy producer from being an energy consumer. Uh, renewable energy cost has gone down, etc. But uh, <clears throat> uh, the point is that uh, at this juncture, the uh, oil prices have come down. Uh, so uh, that shows that uh, uh, the uh, demand uh, is to a very great extent uh, uh, met by the supply. Uh, the, the question is that, uh, do you see uh, the growth in the Asia-Pacific region uh, 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 not being met by the supplies uh, uh, under the current structure? That is question number one. And uh, question number two, for how long will the current energy prices at this level uh, prevail? Because uh, uh, we see that... Uh, as Mr. Vergi said, uh, the international market for energy works well, but uh, it is very vulnerable to supply shocks. The market functions, there is no energy reserve as such. Any crisis in an oil producing country like Nigeria or Libya or Venezuela uh, has a major impact on the oil prices. So I would like to know your views on this. Thank you. We'll certainly come to those, those points. I'm going to call next um, Senator Sullivan of, from Alaska, who was, I think I'm right in saying, on the Armed Services Committee and uh, dealing with Asia-Pacific matters there. And we very much welcome your comments, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks for this great panel. I think it's a really important one. Um, let's have a comment and then a question um, for Admiral Kawano. Um, my comment... Uh, First starts, I want to respectfully push back on Mr. Knowles' uh, definitive statement at the outset about uh, what we're seeing is the definitive end of U.S. military primacy in Asia. Reminds me a little bit of the Mark Twain famous quote that the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, because um, that's not the way we view it. And 
Uh, I don't think it's the way many of our allies in the Asia Pacific view it as well. But my, um, my question goes to, to what you talked about at the very beginning about the importance of how risk can be managed. And one of the things that we've been thinking through is certainly diversifying sources of supply, which you're starting to see with Australia, uh, with the United States, but also um, making sure that those sources are reliable suppliers of energy. So I'll be a little parochial here as a senator representing the state of Alaska. We've been exporting LNG to Asia, mostly to Japan for 40 years, 40 plus years. We were the pioneer in the LNG trade, Alaska and Japan. Uh, never missed a cargo shipment, 40 years. So that's unlike the record of other countries, other places. The Russians are an example where energy sometimes is used as a weapon. Uh, not very reliable in terms of supply. And we had a recent uh, Department of Energy uh, export license that they granted uh, to the very large scale LNG project that we're working on now in Alaska that would be one of the biggest LNG projects in the world. Um, so, Admiral, what I was wondering in terms of how the way Japan looks at energy security, do they bring in the same issues of diversification of supply in terms of geographic diversification. Uh, it seems as if, particularly in terms of LNG, we are starting to see that as an opportunity because there's a lot more diversified s supply sources starting to come online. And the issue of reliability in terms of a country's history, say Alaska or Australia, where there's a, a strong history of um, not only diversification of supply, but reliable supply in stable parts of the world. Senator, thank, thank you. you for those points. Again, valuable ones. I'm going to come back to the panel now. I've noted there are at least two further requests for the floor, Mr. James, and I'm afraid I can't read your name at the end there, but it, um, I still can't read it even right way up. But anyway, I remember, I remember where you're sitting, so we'll come to you soon. Now, coming to those questions, I think, first of all, Admiral, we'll come to you on the question of is the threat to shipping exaggerated? The threat South, to shipping South, South China Sea shipping. South China Sea. Yeah. Right. South China Sea. Yes. Okay. After uh, Japanese. Ano, ito, Chungita. Ano, mazu desu ne. Wale, kore ano, hon kai gi demo kono minami shida kai no hanashi wa ano Kerry kokubo chou kan hajime. え、え、滑走路やはり で、あの、サリバンさんの質問につきましては、え、あの、エネルギー政策は私の、あの、仕事ではありませんので、え、責任を持っていうことはできませんが、あの、日本は海外に資源を頼っている国ですので、今メインの資源のいわゆる中東から
ホルムズ海峡の問題が日本で議論されているのはそのためです。えー、ただ一般論としてはあのサリバンさん言われるように私としてもあのまた海上防衛をに責任を持っている私としても資源供給先の分散化は図,図るべきだと思いますでそのためにも日本アメリカオーストラリアという海洋国家が連携をしてやはり海洋の安定化を図るということが必要だと思いますありがとうございます。Thank you. Well,、um, on the first question about whether the, the threat is exaggerated, I mean, the point I was making was that we're actually a very long way from、uh, any actual disruption of、uh, sea lanes、uh, through the South China Sea. And I, I don't think、uh, at the moment it is in anybody's interest to、uh, begin to go down that path because we're all so completely and utterly dependent on、uh, the sea lanes through the South China Sea. Uh, for a whole range of goods,、uh, not just for our、uh, energy security.、Uh, I think the, you know, the broader point isn't are we there now and therefore is it exaggerated? It is whether、uh, our capacity to manage the geopolitical tensions that are now emerging in the region、uh, is, going to, is going through mismanagement to get to the point uh, where. Uh, Trade and sea lanes of communication are actually threatened, and、uh, we should all be trying to ensure that we get nowhere near that crossover point.、Um, on the question of supply and demand, well, you know, the better your market works,、uh, the much more likely it is that there will be no、uh, disjuncture between uh, uh, capacity to supply and uh, the demand uh, that's emerging in,、uh, in Asia. Uh, and uh, I don't at the moment see、uh, much prospect that we're going to face a supply uh, shortfall. Um, uh, you'd have to believe not just in peak oil, but peak gas and peak every other forms of energy, I think, to、uh, get you into that,、uh, into that territory.、Um, and、uh, on the question of diversity of supply, well, I think, I think any, any country that's an energy importer. Uh, would、uh, put some value in、uh, diversity of supply.、Um, obviously, if you put some emphasis on diversity of supply,、uh, your reputation as a re reliable supplier serves you well in that marketplace, and Australia is very comfortable with that sort of conclusion. I think we could probably give Alaska a run for their money in terms of our history for, of being a、uh, reliable energy supplier. Thank you. Melody, would you like to say a word about that too? Yeah,、um, so we, we take a long term view of prices because our investments last for decades. But you know, the, the market fundamentals of supply and demand work, they come into balance over time. But our industry and does experience a lot of commodity price cycles and short term volatility. They're very common. In fact, the price of oil has dropped 50% five times. In the last 30 years. So it's not an, un, you know, it is a volatility that is not. Um, it has been repeated a number of times. And right, while there might be surplus capacity in the markets today, the estimates are about 2 million barrels on top of about 90 million barrels of oil consumed. But、um, current supplies are in decline. 3% is about the, the, the minimum decline rate. So at a 3% decline, supplies. Um, annually will decline about 3 million barrels. So there is, you know, we're, we're growing、um, new production sources off of a declining base, and that, that is just、um, the nature of oil and gas. As far as diversification, you know, we, we believe that to meet the growing demand for energy, all sources of energy will be needed oil, ga、uh, natural gas, nuclear, renewables,、uh, even energy conservation. Will be needed in combination to meet the, the demand of the future、um, overall. Pierre, anything to add? Perhaps on the supply shock、uh, 
question which has been has been asked. I think th there's there is actually one quite remarkable development on that in that context is the, the Chinese investment in a strategic petroleum reserve. So the last I would say meaningful addition to global SPR capacity was the uh, the U.S. expansion of the of their SPR uh, under the under the Bush administration from 2002 and 2006 seven. Um, now China has uh, invested is investing quite significantly, and I know India has some plans, but has not started to really spend money on that. So I think it's a very good <coughs> it's a very good uh, it's a positive development that uh, the strategic petroleum reserve capacity is actually also migrating where demand growth is migrating. Uh, so uh, we actually maybe in the, in the energy security community look forward to significant investment by India on, uh, on that front. Um, I think on, on US military primacy, I think we are at risk of playing on words. I mean, I, you know, and, and that's not something we should be doing. I think if you leave definition, definition points aside, Prime Minister Lee yesterday evening spent about half an hour reflecting on the various complex implications of the end of the US military primacy in Asia. I mean, this is not something that I'm making up to, uh, to show off. And again, I'm prepared to change the terms in which I expressed it. And in my comments, there was nothing that was directed against uh, the United States or its right and ability to be, to be heavily present in Asia. It's just a fact of life that there is a regional military and economic superpower rising in the region. And so in a sense, just that is a definition of the end of the US primacy. Right, well, thank you, Pierre, for that. Now, this will have to be the last round. Um, and I've got um, at least three requests for the floor, starting with Mr. James. And then uh, down the end there on the left, and then I think Mr. Maeda, you're coming back for a second helping. Very good, Mr. James. Mm. I'm going to ask the panel to <coughs> uh, ask how serious uh, the whole problem of a, uh, of a uh, of an oil uh, the likelihood of there being a problem. It. Uh, and I ask you that because uh, since World War I, nobody has been denied oil, except in a major, major uh, war. Everybody has been able to buy oil uh, if they had the hard currency to get it. If you don't know of any, let me know. Uh, why is that? Uh, there's several reasons, probably, uh, and that's what I think the, the t panel ought to look at. Rather than looking at the problems much, look at the solution, if there is it. And the solutions are many. That's why we have never had a real problem of getting uh, uh, oil. Uh, just a couple of uh, things you could look at is, uh, The, if oil prices go up, it's very uh, the, the the getting the oil is uh, uh, well. If, if prices go up, what happens? You you uh, you, you find that uh, oil is uh, uh, very available because you find more oil and you. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of substitutes for oil uh, over the long run. Uh, and are there really secure, security problems? Uh, Malacca? Hey, you can go around that. It takes it about a day, maybe two days. Uh, Hormoz? Yeah, it, you can figure a way that it could be, you can uh, sunk, uh, sink a ship in there, but it's very hard, and, so, uh, and you can get around it. So 
do, do you really have a problem here? Well, Mr. James, we'll classify you as an energy security challenge skeptic. Uh, there have, of course, been embargoes and uh, blockades and so on in the past, more perhaps on supply rather than uh, the, uh, on receipt of oil. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Lev Lunde from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, com a comment and a question. Uh, comment. Uh, a couple of years back, uh, Norway started uh, uh, transporting LNG from, from Norway to the Northern Sea Route uh, to both uh, Japan, uh, South Korea and, uh, and, uh, and China. Uh, it, it has no, uh, it's of course, the, the Northern Sea Route uh, with transport through the Arctic of, of LNG is a, is a long term prospect. It, uh, there are a lot of climatic uh, changes and other changes that need to take place, but I think the case is still an illustration because I think Pierre Noel said that the main uh, collective good to provide in order to ensure energy security is, is peace. And, and uh, uh, Norway has for long said that in the Arctic, uh, uh, it's a region of, uh, of, it's a high north and low tension. But what is now happening with, uh, with increased geopolitical tension in, in Europe and Russian breach of international law and, and, uh, and uh, Western sanctions means that we are going towards a political freeze. So it's, it's uh, the, 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 the option of increasing Asian energy security through opening up of the Northern Sea Route is gradually disappearing uh, at the moment because of political conflict. It just illustrates the, the, the point of, of, um, of uh, the, the significance of peace in order to ensure security. Uh, the, the other point, uh, my question to the panel is, um, do, do we have the um, institutional arrangements, the institutions needed to, uh, to discuss and handle the longer term energy security issues, both at the regional and global level? Uh, the International Energy Agency is the most sort of tangible uh, relevant energy security related organization uh, at the moment and uh, China, India and other countries are not members. Uh, are we, is, is Europe, the US and Japan willing to, to adapt the, and, and maybe change the structures of global energy governance in order to, to, uh, to engage uh, the major Asian players uh, into the only, only global uh, uh, organization uh, in energy issues that have some uh, that have some teeth, or are we risking uh, are we risking um, a new situation where, for instance, China will use its G20 chairmanship next year, or or into the future, uh, proposing to set up alternative institutions? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, by the way, the, the Admiral excused himself at the beginning. He has a ministerial bilateral meeting at uh, 20 past the hour, so he had to leave before the end. Uh, back to Mr. Maeda next, and then two last ones. You, sir, and, sorry, and you, yes. Yes, thank you, uh, Lord Powell. Uh, since uh, Admiral Kawano's left earlier, so that uh, let me uh, make briefly a uh, supplemental answer to your question on the nuclear as export of the, nuclear, of the energy policy in government Japan. Uh, now, the dependency on uh, Japanese uh, LNG as a source of power in 2014 is now 50% after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear accident. But at the same time, as, as uh, Admiral Kawano said, that the uh, Abe administration is, is going to make the nuclear as a uh, base role. And though that uh, the restart, the uh, gradually, and then the also government Japan announced its uh, best mix of energy in 2030. And it depend, uh, according to this uh, best energy mix, nuclear stands for the uh, uh, 20 around 22 percent, and LNG will be 27 percent. So uh, means of the 22 percent is that the uh, we have now the uh, around 40, uh, 48 nuclear reactors, and also that the, uh, after 40 years, uh, with some exception that nuclear power plants are going to be decommissioned. So it means that if no, no construction of new power plants, the figure uh, in 2030 with the decommissioning of the oil plant is 15%. So it means that the, between 15 to 22 percent, the implication is that we're going to the build new uh, power, uh, nuclear power plants. It's implication. We're not uh, announced yet, but it's implication. On my question is regarding related to the uh, Senator Dan Sullivan's question: is that reliability 
uh, source power, which is uh, Russia. Uh, we, uh, since 2007, we uh, start import of the LNG from Russia from the Sakhalin 2, up to 9 to 10 million tons of LNG per annum. But so far, track record is we don't have any problems. Uh, it's quite different from the pipeline gas, what the Ukraine uh, experienced uh, with Russia. So uh, on energy security uh, uh, point of view, the diversification is most important. But the, uh, beyond that, the uh, reliability itself is also the secondary issue, but it's uh, also the uh, important. So my question is that to all panelists that your views on Russia as a reliable supplier we don't have any problem at this moment, as, as the short-term track record, but you have more experience, so that uh, let me ask this question. Thank you. I think we should have to call you Admiral Maeda from now on. Um, the reason I can't read your name, please, is you don't have one. So can you say who you are, please? My name is Reinhard Budikov. I'm a member of the European Parliament. I would like to mention a risk that is developing where financial markets and climate change policy over, overlap, interject, intertwine, get intertwined. Uh, that is what's being called the carbon bubble risk. Starting from the analysis of the International Energy Association that in order to avoid runaway climate change, at least two thirds of known fossil energy reserves have to stay underground. That is beginning to result in a carbon divestment movement. Just this week, the Finance Committee of the Norwegian Parliament decided unanimously that the sovereign wealth fund of that country, which is the largest in the world, will start divesting from coal. How do panelists evaluate that new risk? Right, and last of all, Mr. Uh, just a very quick question to Melody. Uh, how do you assess possible implication of Chinese economy rebalancing in terms of moving productive assets to central and western uh, regions of the country on the demand on LNG and regional distribution of the energy mix? Will there be any impact or will we see like more LNG powered eastern part of China and coal and piped gas powered western part of China? Right, well, we've got a number of questions there, very limited time left to answer them. Um, do we really have a problem, or are we all getting in a fuss about nothing? Um, what about the Arctic route to the Asia-Pacific? What about governance of oil markets, and should um, uh, China and other countries out here be admitted to the IEA? Should there be some new institution altogether? What about Russia as a supplier? How, how reliable is it? What about the carbon bubble and divesting from coal? And lastly, what about shifting in China of energy resources from the east into the interior? So I think I'll just ask each of you in turn to comment on any of those that you wish to comment on. Peter, I'll start with you since you started at the beginning as well. Select any of those you want to comment on, and then I'll come to Melody and I'll finish with no. Thank uh, you. Peter, sorry, well, Peter. Just very quickly, in terms of the um, how big a problem do we face, I mean, I, I think we are dealing with extraordinarily resilient markets when we look at the oil, uh, at the oil market. Uh, I think um, uh, supply has become much more diversified and that adds to the resilience of the market. Um, I think security of production, to pick up a question the Chair posed uh, right at the beginning, by and large has held up, uh, has held up pretty well. So uh, while I don't think we can, we can totally exclude uh, a, ma a major shock, um, I think what strikes you more uh, about the performance of the oil market is its resilience rather than its vulnerability. Uh, on institutions, I, th I think it's a very important point. Uh, in fact, last year when Australia was the chair of the G20, we uh, sought to draw particular attention to the need for global energy governance arrangements to uh, be uh, reviewed and uh, and updated. Uh, I mean, I think the IEA operates uh, on a fairly narrow band, and it's particularly important that the large uh, economies of uh, of China and India uh, uh, find a place in global energy governance. And whether that's through 
an associate membership of the IEA or through some other mechanisms um, will be for them ultimately to determine. But I think it is very important that we have uh, a global energy uh, architecture which actually reflects the current realities and the current supply and, uh, and demand. Uh, on Russia as an energy supplier, all I'd say is take a poll of Eastern Europe. Um, and on carbon uh, divestment, um, I think, you know, financial institutions and others will make judgments about uh, where they want to put their, uh, uh, their money. Uh, I think one of the questions that uh, people will have to ask themselves is, does it make sense to deny uh, a cheaper form of energy to countries that are uh, in, in need of energy for their economic growth and therefore to reduce poverty and all of the other benefits that come uh, with economic growth. So, uh, like everything in life, it's, it's a balance and sometimes the balance can be struck in the wrong direction. Just a brief, brief okay. answer. A brief comment. On the China markets, unfortunately, I don't have the expertise to, under, to, to be able to describe the, the China market. But when I talk about... Um, just looking at reliability and um, supply, I just go back to the importance of energy partnerships. I mean, com countries are becoming much more interdependent because of the supply and demand uh, balance um, across border. You know, the, the provision of natural gas into Asia creates a very strong uh, long-term relationship between the producers and the, um, the buyers of that gas. And those energy partnerships create a long-lasting trust, trust and reliance that could minimize any disruption over time. So there's a real strong interdependency that is, is created. And, and just to get to the heart of the reliability issue, um, in the countries in which we operate, where we're producing natural gas into the countries or delivering LNG, we, we you know, believe very strongly in the importance of that reliability. We take that very, very seriously. We know that, that countries and economies are depending on that, that natural gas or that our customers depend on that LNG. So that issue of reliability and trust and that long-term relationship is really at the critical core of these, these um, very important energy partnerships. Thank you. And a final word, Pierre. Okay, well, <clears throat> uh, a number <coughs> of questions, but I just want to remind people that uh, Russia has always been an extremely reliable supplier of gas to, uh, to their clients, especially in Europe. Uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, Ukraine emerged as a transit, an independent transit country between Russia and European uh, consumers or importers of gas, and then the problem started for various reasons, which is why actually Russia and several European nations decided to buy infrastructure to bypass Ukraine, which, I mean, half of it has been built, and now because of the political crisis, the other half will not be built. But uh, you can ask any importer of, uh, major importer of gas in Western Europe, all of them will tell you that Russia has always been an extremely reliable uh, supplier of natural gas. Divestment from coal. I mean, you know, I mean, first of all, divesting from coal companies will not deny coal to anyone. I mean, what it will do is it will marginally increase the cost of capital for the coal companies, but they don't invest anyway. So, uh, because the market is completely depressed. I mean, look at the, the share price of coal companies. They've, it's declined by something, you know, between 75 and 95 percent, depending on the companies. So, divesting from them is probably a very good idea anyway. Uh, most people try to gain some of climate change credentials out of their coal divestment, but it's, I think it's just like uh, probably sensible financial decisions. I'm not quite sure that it's good climate policy decisions. I mean, I think uh, what we need for to make a difference in terms of climate is to make carbon expensive, right, to emit in the atmosphere. And, you know, the more expensive, the better. Uh, of, on, on that, from that perspective, divesting from coal companies doesn't, as far as I understand, doesn't, uh, doesn't do the job. Uh, on international energy institutions, I think the, very quickly, the important thing is the convergence of visions and the transfer of policymaking capabilities. And on both aspects, China has gone a very long way. Uh, China has been 
quite significantly cooperating with the IEA, but also with major IEA members bilaterally for a number of years. The policy-making capacity of China in, term, in, in energy have dramatically improved over the past 10 years um, by endogenous learning, but also by, by you know, international cooperation. That is going to continue whether or not they are formally associated to, uh, to the IEA, but I think that's become a bit of a secondary issue. I'm done. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. You've been an excellent audience. I'm sure you'll want to join me in thanking very much an expert and very articulate panel. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>